Words. I think today we are going to be talking about words. Every single one of them has meaning and has magic. And so we're going to dive into some of that meaning and magic. And words in different languages hold different meanings as well. And sometimes trying to transfer a word and its complexity of meaning from one language into another is challenging. And this, my dear, Katrina, it's something that you know lots about, because clearly you talk in more than one language, which I am very admiring of. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I feel very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, and yes, it's it's a topic that is very close to my heart. And uh, I have to admit, I, I started a German podcast episode about this. <laughs> but then uh, the recording hadn't worked. And then, yeah, since then, it's been on my to-do list. So anybody listening who's who's also part of my German podcast, I do apologize. But this topic of different frequencies in different languages, that fascinates me. And, it, and for a long time, it was also a quite a bit of grief around that for me. Because there was a time in my life where I felt more at home in English than in German. And that was helpful in parts and very, very painful in other parts because my mother tongue obviously has a different frequency that matches my physical body differently. And yeah, and it's been quite a journey and storytelling has been a great part of my healing process in this. And I remember there was a a situation in my first year of the Myth Singers course with Daniel Allison, where um, we were doing a workshop and I was telling a story and, and the person working with us said, okay, stop cat now continue in German. And I was completely surprised. And, and uh, first I thought, Ooh, how can I do this? Nobody will understand. And yada, yada, yum. And, but then I did it and I burst out into tears Uh and I continued telling the story. And afterwards, all the people present, English speakers, all of them said, wow, this was so powerful. We we had no clue what you were saying, but it was so interesting and it touched us and it was magical. And that was very profound uh, for me to experience the difference in feeling and to, to be able to sort of navigate both realms. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think talking in a language that you feel rooted in and grounded in and something that you've heard since before you were born. Um, I mean, as babies in the womb, we hear the sounds coming in from round about us, settling in. We learn to understand patterns of sound, rhythms, particular types of music, but also the speech patterns. Um, and there's something about certain sounds we can only distinguish up until we're a few weeks old. And then we actually lose the ability to distinguish those particular sounds, which is why it's really difficult to learn some other languages, depending on what your native tongue is, because you actually just physically cannot hear and process that sound. And I think that's a really interesting thing as well. Over the last week or so, you've been sharing um, Instagram live posts and I've watched a couple of them and they're in German but I just think you are so animated and you get exactly the right level of energy and passion and it just makes me smile to listen to these posts in a language that unfortunately I mean I studied for two years at high school and remember very very little but you communicate so beautifully that you are talking about something that you are really passionate about and it just it makes my heart sing to hear it. Um, so I just wanted to say how grateful I am for you putting these videos out into the world as well. Oh, <laughs> danke dir. <laughs> thank you. 
thank you so much that that was a surprise um yes and i had the most tremendous fun with that series it was called story magic 10 times 10 because i started it on the 10th of october and it was a 10 part thing and i i i aimed to to pass on the tools that i've found helpful in my life uh concerning language concerning wording thoughts anything that works with with language and it's been so wonderful the way that people also interacted and followed the series and sort of shared um their experiences and one of them uh i'll share here because i've i've found it so sweet years ago i met a woman who said oh yes we have a we have a little word treasure chest at our home we have a little box and whenever we come across a word that we that we like that is special or unusual that sort of tingles on the tongue we write it down and we put it in that box and then all um every now and then we we take it out and look at these words and try to integrate them into our language and i find that is such a sweet sweet little tool that can yeah brighten your day that can make interactions different that can broaden uh also your your capacity at manifesting even that's also something that i found very interesting um yes we like i think 90 percent of communication happens with the body and and just energetically and yet at the same time as as you said before we started the episode words are spells and I love that in English it is called spelling. In German, it's different. Um, there's no obvious connection in the wording, but it is that. And there's so much research now. I mean, listen to Joe Dispenza or or one of these uh, great uh, people, sort of um, pioneering this stuff. Uh, quantum physics. It's it's frequency. It's sound. It's 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 wavelengths, right? And it does matter which words we choose. Absolutely. It completely matters what words we choose. Um, David Abram has a excellent um, interview essay um, through Emergence magazine where he talks exactly about this. I mean, his book, um, The Spell of the Sensuous, is all about how we connect and words and so on. But the interview that he did with Emergence magazine, he talks particularly about spelling. He started off as a street magician traveling around and doing magic tricks and realizing that actually when you are doing magic tricks you are communicating on a an energetic level a visual level but also the words that you are using become spells in themselves and yes as you say in english spelling we are casting a spell we are pinning an object, a concept, an idea down into a word and we are spelling it out and we are conjuring that image in other people's minds. We write words down on a page and suddenly people can imagine them and so on. Um, Arnie Ness, who was the founder of the Deep Ecology Movement, he was professor of philosophy, but also professor of semantics professor of words and letters because words matter and he had a whole series of papers that he published on the fact that the words that we use to talk about things are so important and in western languages and cultures we quite often have the separation of self from everything else so we have the ego we have the physical body we have the inner being and the awareness as one set of words and then everything else as another set of words and we use language to other things which is so important and I don't speak another language fluently I'm trying to learn a couple of other languages my grandmother was not a native English speaker though um, she was a Gaelic speaker um, Scots Gaelic and she grew up on the Western Isles in North Uist in a small one bedroom cottage facing out at the wild Atlantic Ocean and up until the age of five she didn't speak any English at all it just was not spoken but when she started school the school system at that point was all in English and speaking Gaelic was banned 
And to the extent that if you were in the classroom and you spoke Gaelic, you would be hit with a cane for speaking non-English language. Um, so she grew up with this attitude that speaking Gaelic, speaking her mother tongue was a, a moment of shame, that it was something that should not happen, that English was the language of the future and therefore that was what she spoke. And my father and his sister, when they came along, they were not taught Gaelic because it was seen as a backward language. Um, and he had spoken several times about whenever there was a family gathering, the adults would all be talking in Gaelic and the children had no idea what they were saying. They were just completely excluded from the language. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. These conversations are so amazing because I learn so much about you every time. Um, oh, wow. And I, I remember when I traveled Scotland in 2019, I uh, was so fortunate as to uh, book a an, uh, total immersion course into Gaelic. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. It was so amazing to me. And that language is like music. Like I hear it and it's like, oh, the, 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 like just the sound of it is magical, magical. And it was, it was a lovely, lovely course. Um, and, and the way we did it, it really was, you left your English at the doorstep. And from that time for the next eight hours, it was just no English. <laughs> and and the first three days were terrifying. And then it just, it sort of just, it, it, ca it came in and we, we washed the dishes and talked about it. We, you did all the like stuff around the house and it was so fun. And I remember I was so impressed by a young man, um, Ewan, in his early 20s, I believe, and he was a father to be. And he had booked this course because he said, my grandparents did speak the language and it has been disrupted and I want my kid to know this language, so I have to relearn it. And I thought that was amazing, especially in a culture. I mean, um, UK citizens, you, you haven't really been so fortunate as to have second languages as a must. <laughs> in yeah. Germany, it's very different. If you want to what? travel the world, it's just, it's, it's what you do. Um, and I feel fortunate in that because from an early age, I've been trained. But here's this young man. Uh, I think he was a carpenter or something like working with his hands and 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 yes, braving this course and cr like really working so hard. And I thought it was so beautiful. And I'm so glad that this this movement is sort of seems to be growing in Scotland again. I think that is so important. And I wish that this sort of thing were available in Germany, but of course, all these older sounds and type of language has been very much disrupted over here with, with yeah, the Third Reich and everything. And so that's also something I'm very passionate about is, can we go back before that and actually find the beauty in our own mother tongue, in the words, in the, in the old ballads, in the poetry um, and it's it's quite an interesting topic to discuss over here because, like, yeah, immediately you're pushed into some right wing corner by some. Um, so it's a very sensitive issue, and I'm yeah, I I'm very passionate about finding ways of of calling that back in because it is our oldest way of spelling as well, just like Gaelic is is one way, uh, uh, yeah, on the British Isles. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think there is a real renaissance, if I can use that word, um, for languages and trying to find the old languages. Because the Western Isles and the west coast of Scotland, there are still some native Gaelic speakers. There is a real resurgence of Gaelic medium education, though, and many places do now have from kindergarten from nursery upwards trying to teach in Gaelic as the primary language and I think that's wonderful. Uh, my children didn't have access to Gaelic um, when they were growing up either. Both of them have started learning it on various apps and so on and I'm very proud of them for trying. I feel some heaviness and some sadness that I've never done that either. 
Um, I remember my grandmother taking me out to North Uist when I was seven years old and all the children on the island spoke Gaelic um, and English. There was both languages were still spoken on the islands um, and I felt slightly out of it because I didn't really know any words. But my grandmother at that point did teach me a few words, not very many, but just to say Kibarahau or Dunadoras or something like that. Um, and I wish that I'd learned more and I wish I'd been more passionate about it when I was younger. But I always found languages and learning languages really challenging. Um, I mean, at schools now, when I was at um, primary school, there weren't any languages spoken. We didn't learn another language. At secondary school, we did. We had the option of French, German or Spanish. That was really it. Um, but most people, when I was at school, only had to take them for two years. And therefore, before because I found it challenging, I did only take it for two years. Now the Scottish government has this initiative called two plus one, where you learn two languages plus your mother tongue. Um, so I think that's a really interesting development. However, I talk to kids who are maybe eight, nine years into their education and they have had six or seven years of language education and still don't feel confident to have any sort of conversation in that language. So I think there is a disconnect between the aspiration and then how it actually works in practice. And I think that's to do with the way that we approach it, grammar, spelling, all the rest. Of course, of course, I totally agree. And also the fact, I mean, people who travel or have been fortunate enough to be able to travel, uh, we know this, it becomes real when you need to use it. And it's just like manifestation. If you don't feel it, it doesn't work. And if you sit on a bench and a teacher is <laughs> yapping at you about how it's done and you, there's no necessity, there's no, what do you need it for? Um, and so it's completely understandable that, that it doesn't sink in. Um, and I've been, I, I, I feel very, very lucky in this because the, like my first overseas travel was when I was five I went to pre-primary in Australia and it was just like you described on on US like I I didn't speak a word of English and for two weeks I was mute and then or so family lore has it I just started speaking and and that was my first total immersion <laughs> into English and ever since then I've been able to travel widely and use it and love it and and make make connections deep friendships in this language and that makes a total difference to mm -hmm. the way my system absorbs it and um and and wants to use it yeah oh wow <laughs> so many interesting discoveries no i mean it's true i mean i never studied french at school um but my parents were both very keen on visiting france we had connections with france my mother's parents um hosted um foreign exchange students from france so we always had people coming in from abroad and so on and I remember as a small child going to France with my parents and just sitting under a table while my mother was talking French to one of the students. I mean, very basic French, but I just remember thinking it was so magical hearing the different tones. And we stayed in France um, for a summer when I was, I guess, about six, seven years old. Um, and it was my job in the morning to go down to the boulangerie and ask for un baguette s'il vous plaît. And I got so excited about having this responsibility. And I only knew a few phrases, but I was able to go down and I went in, asked for my un baguette s'il vous plaît, uh, however many croissants, whatever. And I felt comfortable and confident with that. But then when I was asked questions that I didn't recognize, I then panicked and, and closed up. So, yeah, I think there is something about being able to connect. Um, and even a few years ago, I was in the south of France visiting my father because he ended up moving to France. Um, and I was in the local boulangerie and was getting some baguettes and croissants and all the rest of it. And my daughter was with me and I'd gone in, ordered them in French. And the woman behind me had said, ah, 
and she started having a conversation and I only recognized a few words about vacation and so on, but I understood enough to be able to answer a simple oui or non. And by the time we left, my daughter was like, wow, you had a whole conversation in French. And I was like, no, I only said we or no. And she was like, yes, but you understood what she was saying. I was like, no, but I understood the tone and the essence and little threads of musical magic. <laughs> so beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. Oh, and so it goes on along the line, down the line of women. Wow. And it's so funny because I have that exact same memory of being a little girl and being entrusted with some uh, D-Mark at the time, Deutschmarks. Uh, no, Franc. Oh, it was still Franc, of course, in, Fr in France. And going down to the boulangerie and repeating in my head the sentence. And yeah, and... I don't know, as we're talking, I, I also feel uh, there's a heaviness or a grief around the fact that now, yes, there's chat GPT and there's Deeple and you have all these tools and they are magnificent and they are really helpful. And at the same time, <laughs> I imagine the experience to be very different if a little girl is, um, is uh, clutching a cell phone, making the, the lady in the boulangerie read <laughs> what she wants to to you know being being trusted by her parents to do this on her own and this experience of magical sounds coming out of your mouth and actually having an impact and that's that's uh i think that's what we've come here today to talk about the impact of magical words and i don't know about you but i feel i might now tell a story that would be amazing yes yeah, stories Obviously, stories are how we weave words in the air and in people's imaginations. So I would love you to tell a story, please. <laughs> oh, and I love that. I didn't know that about David Abram, uh, that he was a street magician. Oh, wow. How amazing is that? And it just makes me feel like, yeah, you and I were both magicians as well. <laughs> Raw. The amazing sun god was old. He had created heaven and earth. He had created the waters and the breath of life of gods and humans alike. He was the keeper of herds. He was the master of serpents, of birds and fishes. Ra had many names, but his most high, his secret name was a mystery. No one knew it. And now Ra had turned old. And so he decided to venture down to earth one last time to wander at leisure and admire his creation. So every day he went down to earth and he wandered about and he admired this and that. And he was accompanied by all his entourage. But with every day that he went down, the creatures on earth were suffering more because wherever his foot touched the earth, plants withered away, the earth was scorched. Wherever he passed by, animals hid in their burrows and wherever he came along, humans hid away in the shade of their homes, and still they almost died of the heat. This is how great the heat was that Ra brought down. This was noticed by the goddess Isis, the great goddess whose heart is more courageous and more rebellious than the hearts of a million men. Isis, chosen one, Isis, who sees everything between heaven and earth. Isis felt grief and she felt compassion in her heart for the creatures on earth and she decided to do something about this. And she knew that Ra was mighty. He was powerful, the most powerful of gods. And in order to get him to go back to heaven, she needed all her cunning. 
she had to find out his secret name. One day, when Ra was coming back down to Earth, wandering about, Isis observed from afar that the great god spat on the Earth, and then he went on his way. The goddess waited until he had passed by, and then she went to that spot where the spittle of the great sun god sizzled in the hot sand. And she scooped up some earth with the spit, and she started forming a serpent out of this mixture. She made it noble and fine from the tip to the tail, and then she blew some life into it, and she placed it at a crossroads where Ra was certain to come along at some point. And the next day, the very next day, Ra passed this way. And as he made his way down the road, the serpent attacked him, and it bit him in the leg. Ah! The sun god screamed with pain. He felt as though fire was coursing through his veins, and all of his entourage, all the gods that were accompanying him, said, What is it? What is it? What? Ra was unable to speak. This is how bad the pain was. His, his lips were fluttering, his arms and legs were flailing, and there was foam forming about his mouth. But then he managed to speak, and he said, Come, come, I will explain. This is the, the strangest pain has, has befallen me. I don't know what it is. My, my heart knows it, but my eyes do not see its source. My hands have not made it. I do not recognize this pain. It is terrible. It is the, the most terrible thing I've ever experienced. Never have I known such illness. All I wanted was to come down and see my creation, but then I was attacked by something unknown to me. It isn't fire, but it is burning my heart, and it isn't water, and still I am drowning. And Ra called out to all the gods, and he was hoping that somebody might be able to help him, but none of the gods had any remedy for this. And finally Isis approached, and her language was like the breath of life itself. Her sentences were full of magic, and her words had the power to wake the dead. And she addressed the great Ra, and she said, What is it, great father of gods? You have been bitten by a serpent? Really? Has one of your creatures actually been so bold as to attack you? Well, then it will be very simple for me to drive it away with my words of power. I can help you. And Ra said, Well, yes, but you have to know that I do not know this poison. I have not created it. It is not one of my creatures. It must be a powerful sorcery. This is when Isis said, So, great father of the gods, tell me your most secret name, because a man comes back to life when his real name is pronounced. Ra didn't like this, and he tried to deviate. He said, I am the creator of heaven and earth. I am the master of the mountains. I am keeper of all that dwells on the mountains. I am the almighty creator of the waters that make up the oceans. I made the horizons. I made all the gods that live therein. I am the source. When I open my eyes, it is light. When I close my eyes, darkness falls. My words set loose the river Nile. I am the father of time. In the morning, I am Kepri. At noon, my name is Ra, and Atum is what I'm called at dusk. When he had finished, all the gods held their breath to see what would happen. But the poison continued coursing through his veins, and his torment was indescribable. Isis said, You have told me many names. Great Ra, but your Most High was not among them. 
tell it to me. The poison shall leave the body of a man whose true name is pronounced. In that moment, the torment became even greater, and Ra's face was a mask of terror. And then he said, So, lend me your ear, my daughter Isis, and I will, I will pour my secret name from my insides into yours, because it is hidden in the mystery of my insides. I have hidden it away, so no man and no woman can ever use it to gain power over me. But I will tell it to you so that you can save me. And thus, Isis, the great goddess, learned the most secret name of the sun god. And heaven and earth started shaking as Ra poured his secret name into Isis's ear. And then Isis stood tall and proud and said, Away with you, poison. Leave his body. I have called you here and I am sending you away. I have the power. And look, the great Ra has risen because of my word. He whose name I now know lives and the poison is done. And with this, Ra was able to rise. He was freed from all pain, and he was then convinced to move away, back up to heaven, and the creatures of the earth were once more able to breathe, and they had been saved. And this was done by the goddess Isis, most high of the goddesses, and it was done because she was able to know the most secret name of the sun god Ra. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, <laughs> such a powerful telling and such an interesting theme. Words are important and words do have power. So much power. Yeah, I had all sorts of thoughts while you were um, telling that story. Different avenues, branches to go down and so on. Um, just incredible. Yeah, I mean, as a teacher, if you're in a class, the first thing that you want to know is the, the students' names. Because only by knowing people's names can you get their attention. People's names are really, really important. And the fact that finding out that true name and I think that was a theme that you mentioned a few times within that story. We can be called many things and all of us have different identities. All of us have different layers to who we are. We have nicknames or names that our family know us by. We have titles, formal titles, perhaps the government agencies or whatever know us as. But what is our true name? Who do we actually see ourselves as at our core is so important. And sometimes we don't know or we don't connect necessarily with who that core is or we don't like sharing that with the outside world. So, yeah, I could identify with Ra on some of those points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's so interesting for me. That's also been a journey because I mean, being called Katrina, which is a Scottish name, in a German environment, <laughs> for the first twenty five years of my life was a bane. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. I still remember like dance classes, and you'd have to like you had to move partners like every four like every minute or so, and every time you'd have to re like introduce yourself, then you'd move on and blah blah blah, and every time. I would encounter, what's your name? Can you say that again? What? That's a weird name. What's your name? And and it, it does something to a person. And I can only imagine, I mean, people coming here to Germany from, I mean, we have lots and lots of displaced people at the moment. And and yeah, names that the German tongue, as you said, like we, we haven't been, we're not physically able to properly pronounce the person's name. And that's terrible. 
because it's it's their it's their power it's their it's their spirit and yeah and then and it that changed for me that changed <laughs> also in Scotland because when I was traveling in 18, 2018 I was on the verge of um releasing my fourth album and up until that point I had called myself Cat Baloo which is like a a character from a, a western movie and then on that journey, I realized, no, that's that's not true for me anymore. That's not who I am. I'm not a Western. I'm, I'm not a blonde, uh, pistol firing <laughs> Western maiden. And I have a magnificent name and I need to step into this name. And so I decided to publish that album under my first name, my Christian name. And that was an amazing experience. Um, and so I don't need an artist's name anymore. It's just just that. And still, it's so funny that I f sometimes feel more at home when somebody calls me Katrina than uh, in my surroundings where it is where people are saying Katriona, mm -hmm. which is just a German way of saying it. And um, that's fine, but it's it's something's missing in that. And it's, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting <laughs> path to be on. Names and how we call ourselves really are, and they do make a difference. I mean, my name, I think, is a fairly simple name, but different accents pronounce it very differently as well. And I find it jarring when people say it a different way than I'm used to hearing it. It's not even necessarily the way that, like, if I say Cara, it's quite a harsh k sort of sound, but I much prefer it when people say it because it's spelt with a C and I much prefer the cara, the sort of the curvy, curly sound. And I'm really conscious now when I introduce myself to people that the way I say it isn't the way that I like to hear it. And then there's this disconnect, which is so strange for me. Um, when you were sharing the story of Ra and this idea of what is your name and what is your real name, I'm afraid I'm going to go here because um, it came in um, Star Trek The Next Generation. You have the character Data and he introduces himself as Data. And it is one episode that sticks very clearly in my mind where one of the other crew members doesn't see him as a real person because he's an android. And therefore she calls him data and he's like, yeah, but that's not my name. And she's like, what does it matter? And it's like, well, one is my name and one isn't. And I thought that was such a good point. We have how we identify ourselves and if people deliberately, and that's the thing. Yes, people can mistake our names or have difficulty pronouncing it. But if somebody deliberately dishonors you by saying your name incorrectly, because they don't value you and they don't respect you, then that has huge ramifications. And again, with some of the things that we see in our environment, if we deliberately don't call them by the correct name, even when we understand them, then that is a huge problem because we are cutting ourselves off in some way. Mm, that's very interesting. And you actually have a, 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 a an even bigger name, which yes. you don't use much. Is that right? Uh, no, I don't use it much. Um, so everybody calls me Kara. That is my name is Kara. The only person that called me Karashina, so Karashina is a Gaelic name. It comes from the Western Isles. And the only person that called me Karashina was my grandmother. Um, so that was her name and she called me all the time and and she had a little song that went along with it and she used to sing this song and it was all in Gaelic and I didn't know the song and earlier this year I was at the Cranog Centre so I do some storytelling work at the Scottish Cranog Centre um, they've got a beautiful Iron Age village they are building a new Iron Age village across the loch they do a lot of experimental archaeology there, so trying out everything. So from fragments of fibre that have been found in the loch sediment that are two, three thousand years old, pottery and so on. 
one thing that I've been working on them with is stories and language and the types of things that we would be talking about back in the Iron Age when people were doing these traditional skills. And while I was there, I was sat next to a singer, the amazing Rina Gertz. She is, I was going to say German. Is she German or is she Swiss now? Ah, I've got to get told off because she might hear this. Um, but anyway, Rina, she now lives in Scotland has in, and has lived in Scotland for a long time. And she has learnt Gaelic and she is a wonderful Gaelic singer. Um, and we were sitting next to each other. I was telling stories. She was singing songs in Gaelic and telling some of the legends of the songs. And I mentioned about the fact that Karashina is my name, is the, my grandmother was the only person to call me this name. And I said, where does it come from? Because I know it's a Gaelic name and Kara means friend or dear one, beloved. Um, Sheena means gift of God or something like that. And I said, but where does this name and the song particularly come from? And she went, oh my goodness, that's like one of the most famous Gaelic songs ever. And she sang the refrain for me from this song, and it's all about Karashina, this dark haired woman who walks along the shore and is the most beautiful woman that ever anybody's ever seen. She has a beautiful heart. And I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Um, Serena was generous enough to record herself singing this song for me. So I have a little snippet of it and I'm so grateful for that because yeah, I, I never understood where my grandmother got this song from because it felt really important to me. There was something about this song that, that rooted me to, to her and to place and to time and also a sense of a sense of care, commitment. It was like I was a big hearted, generous person. And I think that that was very important to me when I was young, but it was something I always felt slightly disconnected from. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. That's amazing, Cara. And it's so funny because I've, I've I don't know it's just it's just been a thing I sometimes use your name in full and I love it so <laughs> much that name is amazing and now that you share this story I understand why I've been drawn to the frequency of that name mm -hmm. I mean and I so like <laughs> sorry but I, I have to say this like it's so funny the way you you, you talk like yeah, and Kara means friend, and then Sheena means something like gift of God or something. <laughs> and yes, you are. And that's that's that and that's right. That that's word magic. That's story magic. Anybody listening right now, that folks to me is purest story magic and story medicine. Because it is about the frequency. And so many people have had this connection with this name thinking the thought oh this means gift of god so this name carries that frequency so wow and that's exactly how i feel and we've been sharing this over and over and over how fortunate i am to have found this this collaboration you as a friend you as a gift of god this is amazing <laughs> oh thank you for that 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 is wonderful uh, to hear <laughs> <laughs> but names are important i mean anybody who has a child or a pet or anything that they've had to name so i mean my daughter she has several pets and the stress of trying to find the right name because we attach so much importance and we do we resonate with our names i believe um and if you have a mid name, if you're given a name when you're younger that doesn't resonate for whatever reason, it can feel like a disconnect. So, yes, I think names are hugely important. And I think Isis, um, that whole story, goodness, yes, all the gods and that whole lineage, their names mean who they are. 
they mean the earth and the sky and the sun and the forces and everything and it is so so important those names and our understanding of them so thank you yes. so much for bringing that story oh, oh my pleasure and privilege and yeah it's great to be able to tell it now because it's actually still quite uh, resonant in my field as i'm now like tonight is going to be the last session of my year long uh, goddess project that's coming to a, to a close. And uh, I've talked about this before. I'll just briefly share. Um, it's been such an amazing gift to be on this journey, telling a goddess story every month from last Samhain to this one. And Isis has been the last one. And I had no idea. Like I started off with this project totally open. And every month I would sort of tap into or ask Who, who's next. <laughs> and, and it's, it's been mind blowing the way that this whole journey has prepared me for ISIS. I could not have worked with her a year ago. She's just too powerful. And, and I was absolutely bowled over when I found out that she is the, the goddess of words, like in ancient Egypt, that's the greatest power she was associated with is word magic. She, like, yes, motherhood and, and Isis and Os Osiris and all that. And yet the, the really ancient spells <laughs> on the pyramid mm. texts, for example, they are about her, her capacity with words. And to find that <laughs> at the end of a storytelling <laughs> project that has led me into much more of my power, that has connected me with you, that has done all kinds of things to my life and my work. And now have this goddess show up and go, okay, now you're, you you get to tell my story. And I, as I always do, I, I went deep into research and everybody knows, or not everybody, but it's ve very well known story about Isis and Osiris, how she resurrects him and all these things. And I, I wanted something different. I wanted something that isn't told all the time, that is more, even more connected to who she is. And I found this, this version of of a story that is usually known as the eye of Ra and it is differently told in different contexts, but it's usually told as though Isis is just um, wanting power. She's a, a power hungry bitch in most of these tellings. And that's simply not true. And it's yet another case of, okay, who's taken this story and told it for what purposes? What transformations yes. has it undergone? What's the earliest version of it? And it's been amazing. <laughs> it's been just so, so amazing. And I'm so grateful she's here now. And the experiences I've had, and not only me, my partner as well, and his kids as well, have had like individually separate from each other we've had experiences with isis in the past four weeks and it's just been yeah, the word magic isn't even enough to describe this so i i'd encourage anyone wanting to work with goddess energy yeah reverently approach isis she is mighty and um yeah and if you're wanting more information about this please feel free to contact me you can find me on Instagram. I will be running a goddess journey next year, starting January, um, which will be a very, very deep immersion. It will be in German. Um, but yeah, you're very invited to check it out. It's going to be a blast. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think your goddess, pro goddess project is such a wonderful deep dive into these amazing characters these figures that represent so much in our world um i've listened to a couple of them again i don't speak german which i am regretful for but you feel that weight and you feel that magic and you feel the the light appear so no i would certainly encourage people to find out more about your work and we are also going to be developing something together um, on Thursday next week. So hopefully this um, podcast will come out shortly. Um, but on the 2nd of November 2023, um, we are going to be running a free workshop. Um, it's going to be about thresholds. 
standing at that point where we are about to cross from one state or one mode or one point to another. So thresholds and cracking open, which is then going to be a series of workshops that we are running um, after that on Thursday evenings, um, 6 p.m. UK time, 7 p.m. Um, in Central Eastern time. I'm oh, sorry, Central Eastern time, um, Central European time. Goodness. <laughs> yes, and you can find details in the links below this episode. And yeah, it's oh. To all of you out there, we're so excited. I think I can say we, because <laughs> it's yes. it's been a long time coming. We've been we've been uh, working on this for I think pretty much all of the year, basically. Yeah, I think we started talking about it almost a year ago. Um, yeah. and yes, it has been a long time in the germination, and it's oh, so exciting and so fun. And yes, in the in the preparation process, it's become so clear to me yet again that stories are such a powerful vehicle to transport us over these thresholds and there are i mean throughout our lives there are so many of these and some of them are easier to cross some of them are terrifying some of them we stand at the edge of for ages and then somebody pushes at us <laughs> and and stories are our, our friends and our helpers our guides and and we really want to open up this 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 magic for anybody wanting to come along and and yes let's let's immerse ourselves into the power of story and we've we've um yeah we've selected some of our favorites and we will crack them open for you and together we will find the gems that are waiting in the dark caves of the <laughs> story intestines <laughs> ah story intestines that's a, a different one. <laughs> oh, i love stories because for me they are our maps they contain all the different elements of the world they have branches they have roots i mean we can have nature analogies but they have so many different layers to them and every time you hear a story it uncovers some new piece of magic that reflects against where you wherever you are in your own life those choices those directions whatever it is and I mean, I love the stories that we've put together and we're going to have additional activities and resources for people as well so Yes, the links will be in the show notes here um, and it would be wonderful to hear from people, even if they're not able to join us on the journey this time, it would be wonderful to hear from people um, to hear, well, what is it as part of workshops in the future you would like to hear. But please, if you're curious about what we're putting together, contact us, get in touch, come along to the free workshop on the 2nd of November, because it would be lovely to see your faces, to connect and to try and tease out some of this magic. And I, I dare say we're looking forward to seeing you there. And this is it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us. It means the world. It's so great that you are traveling with us and Kara, Sheena. It's been an honor yet again. I just love working with you. It's, ah, uh, it's, how can I put this? I feel recharged every time. And I wish <laughs> this kind of a, this kind of a collaboration on anyone out there, find the people that make your heart sing and together let's, let's turn this thing around. We can, we, we are the future we're wanting to see. And I, for one, yeah, I'm so grateful to you, Cara, that we are traveling together. <laughs> Likewise, the energy that we create together, I think is so magical and yes, Thank you, everybody, for listening today, and we hope you've provoked some thoughts. Um, thank you, Katrina, for joining me on this. And maybe everybody out there can think about their own names and the words that resonate with them, the ones that just make them smile. So thank you. Goodbye and blessed be. Mm -hmm.